All right, looks like we're live. Welcome everybody to live valuation. I'm Midas Moriarty, and today we're going to be taking a look at uh, ticker E or F E E X F, which is uh, Ferrex Co PLC, another foreign mining company. Give me a couple minutes to check some of the stream settings. Make sure everything is up and running. Okay. Mm, looks good. All right. So, Ferrex Po PLC. Uh, interesting company. Uh, the the company trades on multiple exchanges throughout Europe. Uh, the Swiss exchange, uh, I believe the Polish exchange, as well as the uh, London exchange and a couple others. Uh, this particular ticker, the FEEXF, is an ADR slip uh, concurrent with the London shares specifically, uh, which is FXPO, um, the, the original ticker, this one right here. Uh, so these two are roughly comparable. The 303 that being pence uh, converting over to the 424 in USD. Uh, the company is an iron ore uh, miner or, or, or iron pellet uh, miner and distributor. Uh, they own a couple mines in Ukraine as well as in Odessa and uh, a few shipping facilities and uh, uh, shipping containers and boats on some of the waterways in Central Europe across the Danube and the Rhine rivers. So they're basically a very European focused business, but um, a commodity business the iron in the iron ore industry. Uh, so another, another commodity to kind of add to the list of ones that we're kind of choosing to monitor based off of the iron ore prices as of their, their current levels. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised to find that this isn't necessarily a great deal at this precise moment, but it could be an opportunity in the future. That's kind of the thing when it comes to uh, commodity companies. You kind of just have to choose a time to value them regardless of what you think of the commodity price and then just kind of wait for the commodity price to go too low. Uh, but we'll be using the same sets of assumptions that we used for uh, BP or BHP, which was the uh, Australian iron ore miner. Uh, they were a little bit more of a diversified miner, but we still use iron ore as our correlative uh, commodity for projecting revenue prices. So this is the same set of iron ore assumptions that I use for that company uh, from the lower $31 to possibly a high of $153 with an expected value of 89. So basically the same set of assumptions as far as the commodity pricing goes, just gonna get that uh, stated out of the way. Um, and then we do have projected revenues for them already in place of anywhere from 978 million to 1.7 billion in five year forward years, which it's worth noting that that's kind of the range that they've had over the last five years, incidentally, kind of coincidental that that's what they came up with, but that is the case. So you could, as you can see right here, it's like, we're not even arguing that they're really gonna grow. We're just arguing that they're essentially gonna be bouncing back and forth somewhere between the range they've been over, over the past five years. Uh, so that is what it is already handled the uh, segmentation it's all just steel mining so relatively simple to uh, calculate up i do need to double check this okay yeah so 1.24 being the unlevered uh weighted beta they don't have very much uh debt so it might be something in that range after levering it up 1.34 sales to cap ratio is relatively high with 7.24% uh, adjusted net margin, which is relatively low. Um, it is a pretty high sales cap ratio, so if that actually maintains, then that's pretty good. Equity risk premium for revenue has become to 5.36, and for projection, we're using just the global average, so 5.76. Uh, 50-50 between those, we end up, after adjusting for the ratio, we get to 5.58 for equity risk premium. Again, they have a relatively low amount of debt, uh, of only about a quarter of a billion, uh, weight average of 23 years, 2.37%. Um, and that's comparative to the 2.5 billion market cap that they're trading at right now. And that's also as of the end of the 2020 year, which I know over the last six months that they have uh, actually paid down a significant amount of debt, which we'll have to take into account as we uh, project forward. So we'll, we'll, we'll just have to adjust for that. But 
the point is they do have a relatively low uh, debt to equity ratio. I'm pretty sure it's probably like 5% or something right now. Um, I did do the first year of financial numbers already in place here because I just wanted to look at a few things ahead of time. So I can say that right off the bat in the first year they had uh, this in 2020, they had 37% margins, which is way higher than the 7% we were seeing for the industrial average and 1.14 sales to capital ratio, which is lower than the industrial average uh, we had for them, but that's still relatively high. 1.14 plus a 37% margin equals a pretty high return on invested capital. I mean, you can see 43% here for this one year, uh, which gave them 52% returns on equity. So uh, we'll see how that average is out over the long run, but it does look like they do have a strong competitive position, at least in that most recent year. Uh, so anyway, as I said, we will Hop into the rest of the numbers. All the cash flows are in USD, so there's luckily no real conversion shenanigans to deal with on this one. And we do only have uh, eight years in total to do for them. I already have the revenues in place here. So uh, with one of them already done, that means we really only have seven years of finances to, to put in today. I will play their uh, most recent uh, quarterly earnings. Oh, wow, what the hell? Problem with some of the stream stuff over here one moment why restream is logging me out midstream may not matter but give me two seconds okay Got that fixed. That was weird. Anyway, so I will play the most recent earnings call while I do the other seven years of financial data. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our presentation for the Forexpo interim results covering the half year to June 2021. My name is Lucio Genovese, and I'm the chair of Forexpo. I'm pleased to be joined today by Jim North, Nikolai Kladier, and Brett Salt, who will be able to provide a detailed overview of our business performance so far this year. Moving to our presentation today on slide two, we are proud to report that we have continued the trend of strong safety performance, thereby delivering the excellent results presented here today in a safe and sustainable manner. Over the years, we have invested considerably in our assets, and in our people. And this has enabled us to take full advantage of the recent high demand for high-grade iron ore. We are, however, not resting on our laurels. And we are continuing to invest in order to grow our business, not only to grow our production volumes, but also our product quality, whilst adopting modern technology for further benefits in safety and productivity. This investment and strong cash flows allows us to announce an interim dividend today, reflecting the strong performance of the group in 2021. Finally, I'd like to welcome Anne Kristen Anderson, who joined our board in March and is our fourth independent non-executive director. I would also like to congratulate Nikolai Kladier, who was recently appointed as the chief group's chief financial officer, stepping into this role after 15 years with the company in Ukraine. And with that, I hand over to Jim, who will introduce the team and take us through the group's continued strong performance. Thank you. 
Thank you, Lucio, and good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining us on this morning's call. I'd now like to take you through a few key highlights in our performance before handing over to Nikolai to take you through today's financial results, and then to Brett, who will discuss the recent strength in the iron ore market. So as you can see on this slide, there are several key themes. Our financial performance is important, but more importantly, that we conduct ourselves safely. We are proud to report that our key safety metric, our lost time injury frequency rate, continues to remain below that of our historic average and well below our industry peers. I'll let Nikolai go into details on our financial performance, but this half year we are pleased to report an EBITDA result up 147% on last year. Our carbon footprint continues to see material reductions, registering a 6% reduction so far this year and putting us 21% below our baseline of 2019. Through our strong financial performance and strong balance sheet, we have continued to be able to deliver solid shareholder returns and announcing a 39.6 US cent dividend for Sheridan today. We are also looking for further growth in production volumes and product quality. And I shall, I shall go into this later in our session today. With that, I'll hand over to Nikolai, who will take you through our financial results in more detail. Good morning, and thank you very much, Jim. It is a pleasure to be here this morning to present our financial results to you all. My name is Nikolai Klediev, and given that this is my first time presenting as Group CFO, I can provide a quick overview of my background for those that do not already know me. Whilst I was recently appointed as Group CFO, I have been with Ferexpo for over 16 years, joining almost two years before our IPO. And after the successful IPO, I have been the CFO of our main operating entity, Ferexpo Poltava Mining, as well as being a member of our executive committee. I look forward to meeting some of you during our roadshow over the next few days, as well as others during the conferences that we usually attend throughout the year. Hopefully, this should be a reasonable set of results to begin with. Moving on to slide five, we can see our summary financial performance. Our results in the first half of 2021 reflect our position as a producer of high-grade iron ore pellets, with steel makers globally showing strong demand for high-grade material. And through our investments over the years, we are well positioned to take advantage of the current trends in the markets. Brett will cover the markets in detail in the sections of the presentation today. But as you can see from the table, we have seen that iron ore prices and pellet premium have driven a 74% increase in revenues in the first half. Looking at C1 cost, this uh, increased to $47 per ton, with this figure in line with the historical cost level, but following a year where COVID drew commodity input costs down. Moving down the page to our underlying KBDA, we saw a BDA margins increase to 64%, which reflects our increasing product quality and strong market conditions. In terms of CapEx, Given the strengths of the markets, we have made a decision to advance our growth plans, investing $142 million during the period, an increase of 48% for this period. Within this figure, we have funded 93 million US dollars on expansion capex, including $20 million spent on our ongoing pelletizer upgrade work, which will add further pelletizer capacity, $21 million invested in our press filtration upgrades, which will further improve pellet, pellet quality, and $3 million US dollars invested in the solar power pilot project, as well as $2 million for the mining lead automation. Through our strong cash generation, we repaid our main debt facility on 30th of June, and the cash balance shown here is following this repayment taking place with the group maintaining its net cash position, which was originally established at the end of 2020, after a period of significantly deleveraging our balance sheet. 
Looking now at our BDA waterfall chart on slide six, it is always useful to understand the key drivers behind this measure. Here we can see that the group's investment in becoming a producer of high-grade iron ore has delivered approximately 750 million US dollars of additional profit, with smaller negative impacts from a reduction in sales volumes, which relates to a destocking process that was completed in the first half of 2020, as well as small increases to freight, C1 costs, and other costs. During the first half, we saw also our local currency, the Ukrainian Grivna, appreciate from 28 to 27 to the dollar, with the Ukrainian economy returning to growth in 2021, and this small change can be seen in the small non-cash operating forex shown here on the table. Our low cash cost of production has always been one of our strongest attributes. And here on slide seven, you can see the key drivers behind our cost. C1 costs were reduced in 2020 as COVID-related measures impacted commodity input costs such as diesel, gas, electricity, which as you can see from the pie chart here, collectively represent approximately 40% of our cost base. In 2021, as expected, we have seen a rise of our cost of production as the world economy recovers and industrial output increases. We can see this impact in the waterfall chart in the middle of the page, which with rising commodity input costs representing approximately 90% of the cost increase seen in the first half. We also saw cost rise in relation to maintenance costs which reflects primarily execution of delayed work on our mining fleet, as well as uh, our crushing and beneficiation equipment, which the minor depreciation of our local currency, as mentioned earlier in this presentation, resulted in a small cost benefit. In terms of the reminder of 2021, we expect that costs to continue to track commodity prices with C1 costs also expected to include further stripping and pelletizer maintenance as we position ourselves to our next phase of the growth. Moving on to our cash flow now on slide eight, we can see the distribution of profits throughout our business in the first half. We saw a working capital increase related to trade receivables and inflated purchase prices. The movements in interest and tax should be self-explanatory. And we saw a $29 million inflow of other costs as an accounting entry that resulted from the appreciation of our local currency. In terms of capital allocation, we have always aimed to maintain a balance of payments, with the group able to make, to make early repayment of its main debt facility in June. This repayment was made on the basis of the facility coming towards the end of its term, and repayment represented the most efficient use of funds given the group's cash position. During the period, we also distributed 53 US cents per share in, term, in form of shareholder returns. And we are also pleased to announce today an interim dividend of 39.6 US cents per share reflecting the robust financial performance of the group in the first half of 2021 and continued balance sheet strength. The group remains in a strong financial position with previous investments yielding growth today and further investment to deliver further growth in the years ahead, whilst maintaining strong balance sheet metrics. Looking now at slide nine, Disciplined capital allocation has always been a key priority for our business. Balancing levels of investments and the growth of our business with shareholder return. Here in the chart, we can see we have consistently invested in our assets, taking full advantage at times of stronger market conditions to grow our business. And it is through the grow this growth that the business has delivered strong cash flow through being a high-grade iron ore producer and has strengthened our balance sheet. This 
has put us in a position to issue shareholder returns, such as the one announced today, 39.6 cents per share. And with that, this brings us to the end of the financial overview of our performance in this first half. Thank you for listening. And I'd now like to hand over to Brad, who will take us through the market movement we have seen so far this year. Thanks, Nikolai, and good morning, everyone. My name is Brett Salt, and I'm the Chief Marketing Officer for Fair Expo. It's a privilege to speak to you today about the iron ore markets, firstly, about our position as a high-grade producer of iron ore, and then the market outlook in relation to the near term, as well as the longer-term decarbonisation of steel. Moving on to the next slide, we take a look back at 2021. In terms of the iron ore price, we've seen continued strength and volatility similar to the second half of 2020. COVID-19 has continued to impact on the steel sector. The stimulus packages introduced by governments have positively impacted our customers' operations and downstream demand. These changes in demand have allowed us to pivot our portfolio back to European markets in 2021, giving us a sales balance in line with historic levels when compared to last year. During 2021, our location in Ukraine continued to demonstrate its strategic importance and our proximity to our customers played a key role in the value we delivered. We also continued to price our products off the 65 index, reflecting the high grade nature of our pellets. And through this, we've been able to generate strong margins. And now focusing on the pellet premium, the elevated levels seen in the first half of 2021 reflect both strong demand for iron ore, but also increasing environmental controls, with pellets enabling steelmakers to lower their emissions, a factor that will grow in prominence as time goes on. The second factor is something I'll come back to later in this section. The global economic recovery has allowed us to rebalance our portfolio and see strong profitability through being a pellet producer and the premiums that this provides. Now, having taken a look backwards, here on the next slide, I'd like to take a quick look forward at the remainder of the year. On the demand side, there are two key factors. Firstly, there is a potential for future demand disruptions driven by COVID-related recovery patterns. And secondly, we're looking to see how global demand consolidates in ex-China markets. As shown in the chart here on the left, we can see that demand has returned in European and Asian markets. This is a strong positive for our business, as these are key markets for pellet demand. Further evidence for demand can be seen in the chart on the right, showing prices for hot roll coil. This is a good indicator of pricing for high quality steel, with these prices rising sharply in the first half of the year, and all regions seeing significant increases. For us, steel prices in Europe and Asia are most relevant seeing 100 to 200 percent increases year on year. This strong demand picture not only helps explain the price rises for iron ore that we saw in the first half, but also provides a good view of the overall strength in the steel value chain, with steelmakers enjoying healthy margins. One variable to note in all this is COVID and how the future variants may impact the market. We remain vigilant with respect to this and feel that we can draw comfort in the flexibility and agility that we showed during 2020, where we were able to quickly change our sales portfolio to match market demand. Looking beyond the, beyond the near term, there is an exciting opportunity unfolding for producers of high grade iron ore pellets, as shown here on the next slide. Stakeholder awareness of carbon is changing our operating environment which in turn is increasing the value of high-grade iron ore. The European Union has set ambitious carbon reduction targets, and meeting these targets will drive steelmakers towards higher grades and more direct charge material, driving pellet demand as a result, and away from fines that are typically produced by the majors. This is because pelletising emits much less CO2 than fines by sintering, and steelmakers are unable to use 100% scrap for key flat steel products, which are typically used in the auto industry. As a result, many of the pathways to lower CO2 emissions are based around the use of iron ore pellets. 
In addition, steelmaking technologies exist today with low carbon footprints, such as the EAF and direct reduction mid-rex processes, which use high-grade pellets to reduce steel with 40 to 60% less CO2. And through this, we can reduce our own scope three emissions as a result of simply producing more GR pellets. We expect these factors to drive increased pellet consumption and therefore pellet demand. The direction of the steel industry is clear. Our customers are already moving towards a greener future. Steel makers are moving towards higher grade raw materials as well as iron ore pellets, incentivised by governments and stakeholders to reduce their environmental footprints. So in considering this, Fair Expo is positioning itself for the green steel revolution and we're moving to support our customers in this shared journey. We've been undertaking a quality upgrade of our products over many years, and we are now able to reduce commercial volumes of direct reduction pellets. These are a higher grade, lower impurity pellet that are used in low carbon forms of steel making. And we're delighted to announce our first long-term contract for this product, helping demonstrate the quality of our DR pellet offering. Green steel therefore represents a significant opportunity for Fair Expo, and we're looking forward to helping facilitate the transition to low carbon steel making with demand for DR pellets expected to increase significantly in the years ahead. So moving on to the next slide, concluding the market section of this presentation. We've seen strong increases in prices in the first half of the year, but we expect the supply side response in the second half of the year to taper prices. Furthermore, we're also expecting to see a reduction in demand from the historic levels seen in the first half. Overall, iron ore prices are expected to soften, but will remain at elevated levels relative to historic norms. Long-term observers of the iron ore market will know that this message is well understood and should not come as a surprise. There are, however, a few key points to note. Firstly, new supply is likely to come from low-grade deposits in Australia and India. And this simply serves to strengthen the case for high-grade premiums to stay higher for longer. Secondly, environmental controls are not going away. Even throughout 2020 and the financial shock of COVID-19, governments have retained their focus on reducing emissions. And as a result, we expect the long-term case for pellets will only grow stronger. And with that, I hand over to Jim to provide a broader overview on our business. Thank you. Thanks, Brett. Uh, in this section, I'd like to take you through the overall performance of the group. And before we wrap up, we'll have an opportunity for people to ask questions. And in doing so, I'd like to highlight the key focus areas for us in the near term. These are safety, production growth, technology, and our responsible business activities. So on slide 16, our operations update. How did, how did our operations perform in the first half of this year? As always, safety at our operations remains the first topic of conversation. And as we look to embed our safety first culture throughout our business, in the first half of this year, we had an excellent result in safety, which we're very proud of. Three of our four operating entities achieved an injury-free first half year, and the group's overall injury rate continues significantly below our historic average and well below our industry peers. In terms of production, we achieved 5.6 million tonnes in the first half of this year, which is in line year on year. A good result given the amount of upgrade work that we've carried out this year on our pelletizers. We've now completed three out of four lines in terms of upgrade, and we'd expect an additional half a million to one million tonnes of pelletization capacity to be installed at the end of this year. Perhaps, however, something that's more exciting is the next phase of our growth, which is already underway. We are looking to grow our business beyond our current level of 12 million tonnes per annum, adding a further 3 million tonnes of output this year. We've already signed contracts with key suppliers, Weir Minerals and Metso for our long lead time items, crushers and grinding mills, and these are critical for the next phase of our growth. One of our four pelletizers lines will be upgraded from three to six million tonnes a year, and this will mark the next major phase of investment for the group over the next three to four years. And we'll look forward to provide the market further information on this in the second half of this year. 
So moving on to slide 17, direct reduction pellets. It's important to note that growth for us is not limited to production volumes. We're also seeing growth in product quality with our high grade direct reduction pellets representing the future of our business and the pathway to low carbon steel production. As mentioned by Brett in his section, direct reduction pellets at 67% FV are high grade pellets that are utilized in low carbon methods of steel making. And we expect demand for this type of pellet to significantly increase in the years ahead. A common question we get, however, is how do we produce these pellets and what level of investment would be required? The answer for us is very simple. We're already producing these pellets. We are doing so using ores from our existing mines and processing them in our existing processing facilities. And we were able to produce direct reduction pellets today. And we've re recently secured our first long-term contract. Currently, DR pellets are predominantly sold in the Middle East and North America, representing two new markets for us. Beyond today, however, we expect demand for DR pellets to increase significantly around the world as environmental controls push steelmakers to switch to low carbon forms of steelmaking. With steelmakers in Europe in particular at the forefront of this change, which happens to be our closest market. Finally, it's worth noting the fact that by producing greater volumes of DR pellets, which are used in low carbon forms of steelmaking, this will drive down our scope three emission footprint. This scope three currently represents approximately 90% of our overall carbon footprint. And this provides us a significant opportunity for our overall business going forward. So moving on to technology and innovation, looking now at our modernization strategy, this is an area we'd like to consider ourselves fast followers of successful innovation. And mining is an industry that's well suited for this. At Fair Expo, we're keen to embrace new technology to further improve our safety standards, upskill our workforce and deliver greater productivity. As a result, we're adopting new technology and driving innovation throughout our business, placing Fair Expo at the forefront in the mining industry. We're doing this through investment in our people, in our assets, and in Ukraine. Examples of this work include our ongoing fleet autonomy project. We now have five autonomous trucks operating in production, and this sits alongside our semi-autonomous drill rigs and, and drone surveys. This is an example of the modern technology that we've already deployed. Also in mining, we're looking to adopt technology to further reduce our carbon footprint with advanced discussions underway with our suppliers for the full electrification of our mining fleets. This will enable our trucks to use clean energy rather than burning diesel. In a similar vein, we have now our own solar power project, which was built in the first half of this year and commissioned in July. This project has a capacity of five megawatts. And it's a pilot project to test the effectiveness of solar power in our location over the next couple of years. The projects I've mentioned here represent our near-term initiatives that are currently happening on site. And there are other areas of discussion in terms of technology and innovation that exist, including battery technology in our mining fleet and our locomotives. And I look forward to discussing these projects at the right time in the near future. So moving on to responsible business, Rounding off today's presentation, we are delighted to announce the publication of our latest ESG report, which is available on our website. Our responsible business report covers everything from workforce safety and wellbeing to the environment, good corporate governance, and our community support projects. And I encourage you all to take a look at the good work we've been undertaking. To recap on some of the key achievements recently in responsible business, in terms of our carbon footprint, in 2020, we delivered a 16% reduction in a single year. And today we've announced a further 6% reduction in the first half of 2021, primarily achieved through our clean energy purchasing program. We're also protecting our environment through the responsible water use program, whilst embracing new diversity and inclusion initiatives, such as our F immunity program to develop our future female leaders. So in conclusion, the key messages here are simple. Firstly, we're achieving everything presented here today in a safe and sustainable manner. Safety remains our number one priority, and we're looking to continue to embed our culture of safety throughout our organisation. Secondly, we're delivering growth throughout our business. This means growth in production volumes, growth in product quality, 
and growth in new markets. All of this growth has been made possible through our extensive investment in our people, investment in our operations and investment in Ukraine. All of this investment is with a clear goal in mind of positioning Fair Expo as a high grade, high quality company for employees, communities, customers and investors to believe in, future proving our business for the next 50 years of production ahead. And with that, we come to an end of today's presentation. I'd like to thank everybody for joining us today. I'd also like to thank everybody in the Fair Expo team for delivering this excellent set of results. It's down to their hard work and teamwork that's helped build the company to where it is today. We now have some time for questions and answers. So with that, I'd like to hand back to the operator to open up the lines for anybody who has a question. So thanks again for joining us. Thank you. If you would like to ask a question, please signal by pressing star one on your telephone keypad. If you're using a speakerphone, please make sure your mute function is turned off to allow your signal to reach our equipment. Again, that's star one to ask a question. And we'll now take our first question. It comes from Jason Faircloth of Bank of America. Please go ahead. Um, good morning, guys. Uh, thanks for the uh, presentation and uh, great set of results. Um, look, uh, just a couple quick ones for me. Uh, firstly, on uh, capital return, can you just uh, remind us, is there actually an explicit policy on capital return, or would it be more fair to describe it as ad hoc? And then secondly, uh, maybe a little bit uncomfortable, but where are we in terms of the investigations uh, into the related party transactions uh, with entities controlled by your uh, controlling shareholder? Are these behind us now? Morning, Jason. Um, thank you very much for the questions. Um, I, I will kick off with um, the capital return. Um, you have to look at the company and its capacity uh, to spend capital. First of all, um, at, at this stage, you know, we are, we have not developed specifically an explicit policy. Um, we are really embarking on in, uh, capital investments, which are um, very accretive to the company, are, are uh, piecemeal based, are within the capacity of the company to deploy both from a financial perspective and from a resource perspective. And so uh, we need to deal with them on a piecemeal basis. These are highly accretive and highly return uh, based capital investments and, and basically are done uh, as we move along within the restraints that we have, uh, both from a financial and from a resource based um, in terms of resources and technical resources and capacity to deploy these resources. So that, that is really how we are dealing with capital uh, returns. As far as, as the investigations relating to related party transactions, those are um, effectively behind us, as we noted in the um, annual results. Um, we, the, the investigations have been closed and uh, appropriate arrangements have been um, made, which are satisfactory to the Committee of Independent Directors, as well as the board. Okay, thanks very much for that. We'll now take our next question. It comes from Krishan Agarwal from City. Please go ahead. Um, hi, guys. Um, thanks a lot for taking my questions and uh, congratulations for the great set of results. Um, I have four questions, if I may, uh, one by one. Uh, just to push on the Jason's question on uh, capital allocation, I appreciate that you are in the process of developing a specific policy. But if I were to push you a little bit, I mean, what would be your preference in terms of the new policy? Um, is it going to be continued to based on some sort of a payout on net income or you are looking to link the policy to, to free cash flows? So l let me hand that over to Jim, please. 
Yeah, sure. Thanks, Lucio. So Lucio gave a, a brief explanation about our capital management. Um, we've always taken a very balanced approach to the distribution of cash within our business. So in the past, servicing debt, uh, reinvesting in the business and returning cash to shareholders. We've heard investors, we, we had uh, questions on this when we did the full year results uh, presentation and we are investigating uh, the opportunity to formalise uh, a policy around potential cash management and dividends, but we're not ready to discuss it at this point in time. But we are actually investigating what would be, what could formulate uh, or form, be formulated around a dividend policy. And, and we'll, we'll come back to the market at some stage in the near future. Uh, either later this year or next year around our deliberations in that respect. Your next uh, my, my second question my, my second question is uh, around the DR pilot. I mean, um, obviously this is developing to or going to develop a uh, you know, key market or key product for you guys. So can you discuss the longer term or medium to longer term plan in terms of how much of the volumes you are targeting, uh, say by 2025 or later? And then have you had any kind of an indication, earlier indication of how the pricing premium for DR pallets are going to look like versus the existing 65% pallet premium? Sure. Um, yeah, sure. So, look, um, as we as we talked about in our last results, so we didn't focus particularly on the volumes of DR production uh, today, um, but we indicated previously that as we grow our business, a larger proportion of the growth production that we would uh, that we would producing as part of our growth and expansion plan that would be allocated to DR pellet. What I'd like to do, though, in terms of DR pricing, I'll, I'll hand over to Brett, and Brett can talk to you specifically around what we'd expect. Uh, and he mentioned in his presentation the, uh, around the new markets that we're investigating. So, uh, Brett, please. Yep, sure. Thanks, Jim. Um, with respect to pricing, we we follow the international benchmarks for DR um, pellets, and we've been achieving those benchmarks, which at this point in time, Vale sets. Um, they are a premium to a normal blast furnace pellet, um, around ten dollars in normal normal terms, um, and we're we're developing those customers um, through quite a targeted technical development program, looking to do trial shipments with them first, and then bring them on as a long term contract, which is what we we talked about today, and we continue to do that across the region. We're focusing at the moment on the Middle East, um, where the growth markets are. Uh, our initial contract is in the US Gulf, uh, and we're also looking at um, broader markets in Southeast Asia. But in terms of pricing, we expect to achieve international benchmarks, and that, that benchmark is traditionally priced at a premium to the blast furnace market. Yeah, thanks, Brett. I'd, I'd, I'd just go a little further to add that, uh, and we touched on this in the presentation, that as emissions constraints and uh, the, you know, the push for decarbonisation, the move towards more DR technology or carbon free or, or carbon reduced steelmaking processes is going to go, only going to increase. So we see the demand for DR products in the future uh, expanding, which aligns exactly with where we're taking our growth program. I understand. Um, my, my third question is uh, a quick one in terms of your longer term guidance. Uh, sorry, the 2021 guidance. So how should we how should we model in in terms of your full year capex? Um, and then quick thoughts on cost, as in how should we expect the cost to to evolve in the second half in terms of percentage increase, or is there any dollar per ton number you're targeting for the C1 cost for full year 2021? Jim and Nikolai, please. Yeah, sure. So, in terms of in terms of capex guidance for this year, uh, we'd indicated uh, previously that you could expect it to be around the three hundred million mark for uh, for the capex, and that's growth and sustaining. Uh, that's that's historically when we've been investing in the business. What we what we've invested in terms of uh, our expansion, our previous expansion, and that's our intention. And Lucio indicated that when he answered around cash management, uh, that's linked to our capability to execute, and we think that's the right level. Now, in terms of C1 cost, I'll let Nikolai uh, give you an explanation and some detail around that. Thank you. 
Yes, Tim, thank that. you very much. Yeah, about the costs uh, and cost control were always our key uh, component of the cash management. And uh, we as a producer uh, experiencing the uh, commodity price as uh, inflation as was reported in the uh, in the presentation, uh, we are uh, implementing all uh, uh, necessary uh, actions uh, in our production in, the, in our mines in order to keep the our C1 costs under control. Uh, there are financial measures, there are uh, commercial measures, there are also bi production business improvement uh, that are uh, directed primarily on the uh, control of the consumptions of our major input materials. Um, in respect of the remainder of the year, we are uh, uh, following the uh, market and uh, expecting uh, commodity price uh, inflation, uh, we are in a cycle uh, where the commodity prices are high. We are uh, ready to uh, and to, to this uh, to this uh, trend of the input costs and we have included this in our uh, financial model and uh, costs will be always uh, the priority for our controls and this is what have been done in the last 15 years when I was CFO of uh, Forex for Poltava mine and will continue uh, control our costs and uh, manage, uh, manage the cash management uh, in a most effective way to uh, find the, 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 the balance approach to uh, fund our capital growth, capital project and shareholders return. Thank you, Nikolai. And you have a, a last question? Um, and now this is all from my side. Thanks a lot. Okay, thank you. I think we'll take that opportunity to move to these questions submitted online. The first question we have uh, is from a private investor and the question is as follows, Lucio. Why do you think Forexpo is trading at a discount to its competitors? And what are your plans to fill this gap? Thank you, Rob. Um, Jim, would you like to take that, please? Yeah, sure, Lucia. So, um, yes, we're aware that uh, that Fair Expo trades at a discount. Uh, look, I think that historically that's been uh, due to Ukraine and perceived country risk around Ukraine. Uh, I think uh, we have a very different view on the risk in, associated with Ukraine. We're very comfortable with investing in that environment. I think as we've demonstrated uh, in the past and our, and our expectations around our growth uh, program for Ukraine in the future. Um, it's an emerging market. Uh, we're a single asset uh, business and uh, a single commodity. And I think investors generally take those considerations into account when they, they're valuing the company. In terms of uh, demonstration or demonstrable behaviours that we've done, I think we've improved uh, the, the understanding of our business a lot over the last uh, 18 months in terms of trying to increase uh, investor awareness of, of one, the, particular, uh, the peculiarities of our business and how we differentiate ourselves uh, compared to other iron ore producers. And I think that they're, they're quite stark. Um, we're a pellet producer and we differentiate ourselves considerably. And if you think about, uh, you know, decarbonisation in the future, uh, we have a significant advantage over other iron ore producers. And I think that and initially, as, as that understanding starts to unfold, you'll see the valuation on the re-raping of Fair Expo as time moves on. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Any yeah. The next question is from Tony Robson of Global Mining Research. What is the board's position on gearing going forward? For Expo has had issues with debt in the past. In future, will you attempt to run with a net cash position? Thank you. I, I think I'll take that. I think. Um, clearly, um, we uh, have to look at ourselves first and foremost. We, as as Jim said, we're a one product uh, company, and uh, we have effectively one operation, and uh, we are in the Ukraine. 
So we have a volatility and cyclicality uh, due to prices, um, due to the country we operate in. And so um, we have to deal with our gearing in a relatively cautious manner. Um, we obviously want to optimize the balance sheet and uh, financially and um, at this stage, considering the very high prices um, and high pellet premiums, we've been able to deleverage very quickly and uh, get to a net cash position. Going forward, I would say that we will explore options uh, for gearing. We have uh, considerable capital expenditures ahead of us as we move on in these piecemeal um, kind of growth uh, expansions. And so we will utilize whatever appropriate um, uh, financial um, options that are available and efficient and uh, economic for the company. Um, example, financing truck fleets or something to that effect. But effectively, uh, we believe that we do need to have um, capacity um, in, in terms of both short-term and potentially longer-term finance lines. And we'll be working uh, towards that with um, with the, with the finance team. Thank you, Richard. We have a second question from Tony Robson uh, to Jim North. You spoke of autonomous haul trucks and semi-autonomous drill rigs. Given the low cost of labor in Ukraine, does this make economic sense? Can you get a return on this outlay? Yeah, okay. Um, look, it's an interesting question and uh, a lot of people automatically come to the conclusion that uh, companies like ourselves and others in the industry that are embarking uh, on autonomous haulage and, and autonomous and robotics generally, uh, it, it's not a decision related to labour cost. Uh, for sure, labour cost in Ukraine uh, is, is far cheaper than some other jurisdictions where is, uh, is, is extensive, such as Australia or, uh, or, or Canada. Um, but it's not, a, it's not driven by the economics around reduction in labour. Uh, where the, the benefits of autonomous or the deployment of autonomous solutions comes from is, is driven around the utilisation of capital deployed. So if you look at the, uh, the possibilities for the additional operating hours for a single machine, uh, that's where the benefit is. Uh, machines uh, only do exactly as instructed, uh, so you remove the human factor. So what we've seen, uh, both in our own operation and as part of the evaluation of these projects, was that, that maintenance costs reduce, uh, equipment damage reduce, and utilisation of, of deployed capital increases substantially. And that's where the, the economics come in. So over time, you need less machines to carry out the same activity. Thanks, Jim. Rob, any other questions? Yes, we have a question from Thomas Streeter of Streeter Research. What is the latest situation with Mr. Zhivago? Uh, Ukraine State Bureau of Investigation said last month that he was on an international wanted list. Uh, are, is Mr. Zhivago able to perform his director's duty? Thank you, Rob. I think I'll take that. Uh, the latest situation is um, based on representations from Mr. Zhivago and also from representations from his uh, lawyers that he is not on the Interpol list. Uh, Mr. Zhivago has indicated both uh, to, to the board and to myself that he is looking to um, cooperate with Ukrainian authorities and um, is, um, has effectively temporarily stepped down as the CEO of the company um, in order to dedicate time to resolve this matter. Um, we as a board um, are monitoring matters uh, very closely and carefully. And um, at this stage, um, we are uh, of the opinion that we will not make any uh, changes unless uh, circumstances 
do change and appropriate actions uh, need to take place. Mr. Javaga has uh, fulfilled his duties as, uh, as a director of the company, and Mr. Javaga clearly has uh, considerable um, expertise and interest in the company, which are, are effectively aligned with all shareholders. So um, we continue to monitor developments, um, and um, and we will the board will deal with these matters as um, and when necessary. Thank you, Lucio. The next question is from Ben Davis of Liberal. It's a two-part question. How best to think about Wave One expansion in terms of its timing? Could this be done quicker with fast, faster capital spend, given the company's significant free cash flow generation? And then the second part of the question is also on the Wave One expansion: Will it be a step change on completion, or will it be more staggered? Jim, would you like to take that, please? Yeah, sure, Lucia. Um, look, wave one expansion, can it be done faster? Uh, it's not really a, a question of available cash. Um, certainly, as we've, as we've indicated in the, in the release, uh, there's a substantial uh, capital cost associated with that expansion, um, but it's around long lead time items and construction activities that need to happen both within the concentrator and the pelletizer. So in terms of uh, concentrator expansion, you would see we will be progressively installing equipment uh, because it's not one single unit that we're actually doing to upgrade that concentrator. Uh, in terms of the pelletization capacity, definitely it will be a step change. Uh, it requires a, an outage uh, whereby we, we will do a considerable amount of work leading up to that outage but it will require an outage uh, of around about three to four months, which we've currently got factored in where we will shut down and restart at the, at the higher rate. With obviously a, a ramp up, obviously we won't turn off uh, one day and then do the work and turn on and be at six million. Uh, co progressive commissioning over a, over a short period of time will be required. But in essence, in terms of production, you would see a step change year on year. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from a Dennis Sakva of Dra Dragon Capital. <clears throat> Can you please provide an update on the Galashinsky license and its recent cancellation? What happens to this license now? Jim, would you like to take that, please? Sure, Lucio. So we were we were advised, as as I'm sure all investors have seen in the media, that the the government had applied some sanctions and uh, and requested that that Fair Expo hand back that license. Uh, we don't believe that that's uh, an arrangement which is which is covered under the under the rules which which they said those sanctions should be applied, and we're challenging that. Uh, we're currently uh, just in discussions with government in relation to that matter, and those conversations are ongoing. Uh, and we've got multiple avenues which we're exploring. But, but in essence, uh, that, that lease uh, is around 440 million tonnes of resource uh, requiring an underground development. And while it's in our long-term plans, uh, it wasn't in the immediate uh, plans for us to develop in the short term, and it's unrelated to the to the Bellanova deposit that we talk about uh, in our in our programs. Thank you. Jim. Next question is a follow up question from Jason Fairclough of Bank of America. He asks, "What is the strategy of the company to make sure that apparent government campaigns against?" your largest shareholder do not impact minority shareholders' access to the value of the company's assets. Thank you, Jason, for that question. Um, a very good question. I think, um, first of all, I would say that um, yeah, we, we are maintaining a good relationships with government uh, as a company. Um, our business is operating normally. Yes, there are issues, but there are always issues in the Ukraine um, from time to time, and management are dealing with uh, this issue, whatever issues 
uh, very uh, diligently and um, and able to resolve any minor issues. So um, the what needs to be clear is the matters relating to our major shareholder are um, related to our major shareholder directly and do not affect her expo directly. We do have from time to time some gray area in, in, in the Ukraine where they try, do not separate it, but we have had discussions with government um, to explain to them that they do need to separate it and that Ferexpo is a separate entity and needs to be dealt with um, independently of any matters relating to the controlling shareholder. I think government has uh, understood that and uh, we have um, been successful in, in dealing with certain matters, uh, particularly the freeze on the shares. And, and so government has accepted that. And we will continue um, uh, with the strategy, which is a strategy of dialogue, um, explanation, and, um, and basically com effective communication with government to explain that Forexpo is a publicly listed company in London uh, and that there is a controlling shareholder, but there are also minority shareholders and there uh, are minority investments which need to be protected and, and, and respected. Thank you, Lucia. Next question is from a Pascal Moura of Jepolis. Can you please explain the process requirement, Cape CapEx or otherwise, for to move to direct reduction pellet production in terms of time frame and process? Jim, please. Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks, Pascal. Um, as we indicated in the presentation, uh, we're actually uh, producing direct production pellets now and have been, have been doing so for uh, almost three years, uh, albeit in small quantities. Um, the process itself uh, does not change. Uh, and, and the capital required uh, is, is basically zero um, because we have the ability to produce it with our existing processes. The, the differentiator between uh, a direct reduction pellet and a normal pellet is, is only the iron content and some of the physical characteristics. Though that iron content uh, we're able to improve uh, by slowing down the, the existing concentrator and pelletizer. So, recovering a higher grade iron concentrate and then converting that into a pellet. So we lose some process efficiency to produce that. As part, to, to combat that, um, well, firstly, I'd say that we believe the premium that's attached to the, the DR pellet that we sell compensates us for those additional losses uh, in terms of production. However, we are, as part of our growth program, given that the majority of the amount of growth tons we would like to place into the DR market, we will be incorporating some minor changes to the process to allow us to continue to operate either at the current or an increased rate while meeting those DR pellet specifications. Thank you, John. The next question is from a John Massey of JM Associates. Given the high Swiss withholding tax, does the group have any plans to move its headquarters to a country with a more favourable tax regime? Thank you, Rob. Um, I, I would say at the outset, uh, we do not have any plans to move uh, to a more favourable tax regime. However, uh, let's just stand back. This, this structure was set up at the time of the IPO um, with the Swiss uh, domic uh, domicile and, and a London listing similar to the extractors of the world, of, of which today is also is, is growing, is Glencore. Um, however, our business is changing. And uh, our, our business is changing in volume, uh, is changing in quality, and it's changing in, um, in, in the universe of customers. And so uh, what we are, we have mandated management to do is to um, look at our group, look at um, our structure, 
and um, and we're in the process of doing that. And um, this will obviously include um, uh, matters like withholding tax for shareholders, and um, we will be looking at, uh, at, at, at at this review towards the end of the year. And, and we may come back to you at, at this stage. Uh, I don't have uh, any, anything else uh, further to say. Very good. Thank you, Lucio. The next question is from a private investor. Have you considered a share buyback as a form of return to shareholders? Thank you, Rob. I'll take that. Um, we have considered it several times. And in fact, in the past, we have um, actually done a share buyback. Um, however, the impact was really of a short-term nature. Um, I think we will review that again. But uh, as I said, we're a one operation company and, um, and, and a one product as a whole in the iron ore space. Um, and so um, the impact of that share buyback was, was quite limited. Um, we believe at this stage that um, paying out dividends, and we hope that you as a shareholder are happy with our dividends that we've paid out so far this year, um, is, is, a, is a more effective uh, 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 mechanism to reward shareholders. Um, we will nevertheless review it and continue to review it, but our experience has been um, not very good. Thank you, Lucia. The next question is from a private investor. What other efficiency programs are there in the pipeline to enhance your efforts in managing cost? <clears throat> Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, look, uh, in terms of our business improvement program, it's well embedded uh, into our culture, uh, cost consciousness in our environment within the, the operating assets is very high. Uh, we have a, a, a general pipeline of projects and you can consider that our business improvement activities are really no different than our, than our capital programs in terms of growth. Um, we, we have an ideas bank, uh, which is either generated from management, uh, but we take ideas right across our workforce, uh, right down to quite minor things. And, uh, and we look to, to have not only in terms of our safety projects and improvement in safety, which I think we've been very successful uh, at pushing down our recordable injury okay, frequency rates, right, okay. but also in, uh, not only in the areas of cost, but in terms of process efficiency, uh, and, and how the guys just generally execute work. So although I don't have detail uh, to talk about today because it would be an extensive conversation, um, we do have a very detailed business improvement program which we induct people in and, uh, and due to the mature uh, workforce that we have and they've been with our business a considerable period of time, uh, that, that culture is well and truly embedded uh, in our workplaces. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Final question is from Alexander Mukfadstein from Streeter Research. Could you please provide a little more color on the metrics for Expo users as a proxy of its responsible governance practices, apart from the number of independent non-executive directors? Okay. Thank you, Rob. And I'll take that question. Effectively, we um, engage with uh, the various agencies, ISS and, and, and the well-known agencies in London. Um, we also um, look at um, advice. Uh, we, 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 we ask for advice. We clearly are in this process of um, trying to understand exactly all these metrics. Uh, and and uh, we we basically are adopting as many metrics that we can actually deliver upon. Um, so so you know uh, the company is um, is going through the necessary changes that it has had uh, in, in in the past, and uh, we we seek advice from these agencies, and we'll continue to do so. 
Thank you, Lucio. That concludes all of the questions that have been submitted. Okay. Finished out that call. Taking a look at everything. We do have a pretty good sales capital ratio over the long term. Uh, it's been growing pretty consistently, so that's interesting. Um, they've been paying out too much capital. Uh, we were looking at that. You can definitely see that the dividends that they paid out over this this time frame um, has averaged about 96 million per year. And the cash flow that they've averaged in that period is negative 8 million. So um, yeah, definitely overpaying in the dividends. You could say that's paying it forward though, because they were doing, they're going through a little bit of a building phase. And then now in the most recent years, they're starting to generate massive amounts of cash flow. So if they kept up like, you know, the average of the cash flow in the most recent couple years, for a couple more years, they would more than easily have paid that back. Um, it's also arguable that that's fine because of the shareholders equity they have. Um, shareholders equity was shrinking during this time frame, but then it actually grew rather dr uh, dramatically. So obviously if they have the shareholders equity to pay out the capital, then they do. Um, their cost of equity comes up to 8.92% after adjusting for risk. Uh, brings a weighted average cost of capital basically into the same range because their cost of capital is actually relatively high. Um, returns on invested capital are really high though, so, there, so the excess returns are really high. Uh, maybe if we look over a longer term average for the returns on capital, it would go lower. Uh, not actually really. Um, We'll use the three-year average since it's a little bit lower, but yeah, you know, returns on cap risk of capital have been extraordinarily high, uh, which leaves the returns on equity really high. Um, sales to capital ratio three for the last five years, one point oh eight. Over the long run, it's more like one, which is what we've already got it sort of centered on. Uh, according to our technicals, 0.44 to 1.65. So let's say if we just 1.65 and then move this down to 0.4. Still centers around one mostly. Uh, so I'm actually pretty okay with that. We could lower it. That barely even changes anything. But overall, it gets an expected ratio down to 0.94. I'm okay with that. That's a little bit lower than the three-year average we had prior to that. If we look over the long-term average of returns and invested capital, uh, since being it has averaged 26, 27. So sales and capital ratio I feel fine with. You could argue that the uh, that the margins should be adjusted a little bit, but either way, like I said, the uh, here's Three years prior to that, they were averaging 28%. Uh, so dropping it down to an expected 18% is pretty damn low. Uh, the technical suggests us we should do 10% to 50% with 20% for the baseline of the analysts. Um, I'm doing negative 5% to 40%. So that's obviously giving it a way more leeway that direction. 45 is still probably pushing it. Hmm. Let's see. What else? Not too much else I really want to adjust with this one. It's relatively straightforward.
All right. If you look at the uh, Yahoo analyst expectations for them, people are apparently, I love how this is behind. That's interesting. Do we have anything on the, yeah, we do. Oh. I don't know how accurate these are, but either way, on Yahoo, apparently for 2021, they were expecting 53% growth and 17% uh, drop in the year after that. Um, what is it that the number actually come out to be? So, like 2022's revenue, they are expecting 2.15 billion versus the 2.6 billion in 2021. So 2.15 billion. Which isn't even approach anywhere in our in our best case scenario. Granted, our best case scenario uh doesn't really include much growth because of uh the correlations that we have for for the prices. It's like we're we're basing our model entirely off of these sets of iron ore prices. And these sets of iron ore prices do lean relatively low. So analysts seem to believe the iron ore prices are gonna extend further into next year, but my uh, projection is entirely based around the fact that they're basically not. So, you know, I, I don't know, part of me feels uncomfortable that I keep finding all these uh, iron or, or all these mining commodity companies, foreign mining com commodity companies to be undervalued. But at the same time, it's like, I don't know what to say. This is where I'm seeing valuation. And there's reasons for why they would be so undervalued in the first place. Like I said, it is a foreign stock. It's a commodity stock. Um, the country in question operates heavily in Ukraine. They talk about that a lot in, the, in the, the call. There's a lot of geopolitical concerns about Ukraine. Not everyone trusts whether what's going on there. There's uh, corruption related to the government. They had a whole bunch of drama related to their CEO and some criminal investigations that are underway there. So there's a whole lot of questions about that. There's a lot of complications involved in their non-controlling shareholder. So, you know, they voice a lot of those things in the call. So I, I do think that there is more risk associated with this one than some others in some other scenarios like for example comparing this to sandfire resources which is uh, another um high return potential foreign commodity company that we valued recently that i did start a position in i see a lot less specific risk with that one because the the corporate entity involved i don't see it's as much drama involved with it. it just does look like it's an under the table uh valuation partially just because of the high insider holdings in that particular company. But this one, it gets a little bit more uh, geopolitical as far as the reasons I think why it's trading so low. So you could argue that the way that would reflect itself in the valuation is perhaps in the margins, because you could argue that they'll probably, there's probably some unexpected one-time one -time charges, uh, legal or otherwise, or taxation or otherwise uh, to be involved here. So you could argue that I should essentially allow for a further hit to the uh, margins to adjust for that fact. But uh, how much so is hard to say. Uh, it's, hard, it's hard to say uh, exactly how much I should allow that to weigh in. Oh, oh, I never adjusted the debt. That's probably a big factor here. I'm sitting here staring at this like, why is this? You know, I'm looking for the problems. When you find something that's so heavily undervalued like this, the, the, the first thing you should be asked is, what am I missing? You shouldn't, you shouldn't necessarily immediately assume, oh, everything I did already was correct. The market's wrong. I'm correct. It's like, no, you should start with the assumption that you're for, you're missing something and the other thousands and thousands of other people all know something that you don't uh, and figure it out. So like I said, obviously I need to adjust this. So that's probably gonna have an effect on it. Oh, well, it actually seems to help naturally. <laughs> that only improves their valuation a little bit. I'm probably never gonna go to 0%, so we should not have that there. 16% over the 10%. Like I said, I actually already know for a fact that they've lowered their their debt levels in the most recent year so but we're talking about where they're going to go five years from now so
14, 5%. That's probably pretty reasonable as far as the analyst number goes. Um, leave it at 10%. To, yeah. It gets us to a distribute level of 14%. Okay, I'm okay with that. And naturally, that only increased the valuation. Probably a little high for that. Maybe we can drop that down. Okay. All right. I think that's where I'm going to leave it. The margins are now extraordinarily low i think a distributed basis of 13.75 when their current three-year average is 28 percent we're assuming that they're going to lose over half their margins over this course of this again their average margin over the entire period that we have for them is still 21.86 percent so we're still assuming that they're going to lose about 33 percent of their long-term margin over this entire period that the long-term margin includes periods where they had some pretty low returns and some pretty negative cash flows. Uh, so I, I think distributing this low, it's like you cannot argue that this isn't conservative. But we still have a pretty high return potential. So um, there's nothing more I can do to it that would be fair at this point. We can't really damage their sales to capital ratio unfairly. Can't really damage their debt to equity ratio unfairly. Revenues I'm leaving out of my hands and in the commodity pricing. Um, so basically the only thing that I can fairly adjust uh, to try to punish them extra is their margins. And that is the place that I do think that this would show up. Uh, like I said, unexpected one-time charges, some legal expenses, yada, 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 stuff like that. So I'm assuming that those issues would show up in the margins. Here we are, putting it in there. Still end up with the valuation we get. So I think that's gonna do it for us on this one. We'll adjust for defaults and then we can call it a day. Uh, da, 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 da. And we'll say they just paid off in the best case scenario one and then past that we will use the more default metrics. Okay, that should do it for the default risk. Uh, 
All right, so that's gonna do it for us today. Uh, ticker F E E X F F E E X F for Expo PLC uh, Iron Ore Pellet Miner and Distributor uh, uh, Incorporated in Switzerland, trading in London, operating primarily out of Ukraine. Uh, they had sales. Our auctions are here. 10 year treasury today is selling for 1.46%, and we have a mature market equity risk premium of 4.74%. The discount rate I get for them is 8.92%. Their trailing 12 month dividend they've paid out is 12.5%. Uh, they do pay interim dividends that are irregular. Uh, they generally have a basin, but there's a, 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 a basis level, but then there's an excess dividend that's paid off of the excess profits depending on the performance of the year. So. This is not a forward dividend yield. This is just the trailing dividend yield. There's a good chance it could be significantly lower uh, or relatively the same moving forward, depending on their cash flows. But that is the most recent 12, 12 months yield that they put out is 12.5%. And five years ago, they had sales of $961 million uh, compared to the most recent year of $1.7 billion, which is a 12% per year sales growth uh, metric for the last five years. Their sales to capital ratio has averaged over the last three years of 1.08, which is uh, lower than the industrial expectations we have of them of 1.34. Uh, and they have returns of invested capital of 33.79%, which is extraordinarily high, and a debt to equity ratio of 10.75%. And on that debt, they have a default risk of about 0.69% per year, the so relatively low default risk. Their uh, adjusted profit margins are 28.41%, which is extraordinarily high compared to the profit margins we expect on the or industrial average of 7.24%. Uh, and they had in the most recent year, a profit of $635 million, uh, which is relative to the price that they're currently sharing at of $4.24 per share. The probability distribution we use for them is uh, even across the board because we're using a commodity price regression model for our uh, revenue projections. Uh, and the uh, sales driver we're using is iron ore. And the prices that we are uh, projecting for them five years from now is anywhere from $31 to possibly $153 on the high end with an expected value of $89. And based on that, we come up with revenues for the company of anywhere from $978 million in five years for revenues to possibly 1.7 billion in five years for revenues uh, with a distributed basis of 1.3 billion, which gets them anywhere from negative 10.5% sales growth per year for the next five years to basically being flat for the next five years. On an expected basis, we are assuming about a negative 5% per year. Uh, so we are projecting uh, lower iron prices five years from now, and we're projecting lower revenues as a result of that. Returns on invested capital, uh, we do project for them to be about 16%, and that's a result of a projected sales to cap ratio of 0 0.9, which means we do expect it to decrease from its current level and to continue decreasing from the overall uh, projected level of their industrial average. Uh, but we do think that their and that we do think their returns on invested capital will collapse rather dramatically too. Um, but this is mostly on an expected basis, which which uh, weighs in a lot of negative outcomes. So they could ma maintain relatively high returns on invested capital alternatively as well. We do think they'll likely issue more debt to achieve uh, these sales and these returns, bringing their debt to equity ratio possibly up to a distributed level of around 14%. Uh, and we expect their default risk to, to rise to a much more substantial 3.19% per year for the next five years, but that's mostly because of the heavily weight uh, uh, applied to their uh, more negative potential outcomes. So overall, I don't, it's not really that much default risk. It just looks like more default risk than than it otherwise might because of that. As a result of that, we are projecting adjusted profit margins of 13.75%, which is dramatically lower than the current level of 28%. Um, but as I was saying there, uh, that's partially me being extra conservative based off of a lot of the uh, uncertainties and complexities surrounding the company and the geopolitical risk and management risks and operational risks and a lot of other issues and me assuming a lot of negative potentialities come in partially just because I was blown away by the the high return potential for this particular stock so I was getting a little skeptical and decided I really wanted to put a really low base in for its worst case scenario uh, margin outcome 
a relative to the, the high margins that it's currently putting out. So that gives us a distributed level of 13.75%, but I still honestly personally think there's a good chance that it would remain more like in the 20% range. Um, either way, that gets us a distributed profit level of anywhere from uh, almost $100 million loss to possibly $600 million in profit in the five year forward period. On a distributed basis, we're expecting maybe $200 million, but again, it's mostly about the range of those outcomes and the different valuations that those outcomes provide. Um, based off the discount rate that we're using, that gets us a distributed uh, current value price of $6.40, which is about 51 percent lower than the current or 51 percent higher than the current share price uh, which gets us five year four value targets unadjusted for the dividends that would be paid out during the period of anywhere of a low share price of anywhere from one dollar and 81 cents per share to possibly a high end of 21 dollars and 72 cents per share on a distributed basis we expect nine dollars and 81 cents per share which compared to the current share price gets an implied return on invested investment for the next five years of 18.28%, which is uh, very high expected returns, very high relative to um, to the beta as well as the company specific beta, uh, very high uh, potentialities compared to the negative outcomes on the whole, uh, and also really high qualitative factors. As I said, the sales capital ratio is a little bit lower than the industrial average, but the profit margin is so dramatically higher than the industrial average that the, between the two on, high, on whole, it's easy to see that on net, they're definitely sitting at a very strong qualitative position uh, in their business relative to their competitors, which does get, does get them a relatively high valuation score uh, based off my own uh, personal buying criteria of 1.49. Uh, and the short-term pricing metrics uh, is not very meaningful because we don't have an analyst EPS growth number to input into the, the valuation. So 18% returns, which uh, if you adjust for the time differential, it actually comes closer to about 20%. So because again, this evaluation is as of the end of 2020. So we have to sort of adjust for the amount of time that's taken place since then uh, based off the discount rate. And if you adjust for that, we actually it actually comes up to closer to 20% today. So uh, the very high returns, like I said, there's a lot of concerns surrounding the company though. So I don't feel the, uh, the rush to go out and buy this one as quickly as I did with, uh, as I was comparing to Sandfire Resources. But I do think they're heavily um, comparable uh, as far as uh, the, the reasons why their valuation is being ignored. Um, I, maybe I would wait to see if iron prices would dip a little bit lower in the short run because uh, I, I, I do uh, commodity price uh, correlations for a lot of commodities and not a lot of them are projected to go down over the next five years and iron ore is one of the few in that in that boat so the the fact of the matter is is I, I would much rather buy into a commodity company if I thought the commodity price was going up than thinking that the commodity price is going to go down so uh, perhaps perhaps this is uh, that's another reason to not quickly jump into this one so much as uh, perhaps Sandfire which was a, a copper producer as well as gold and silver so it has a slightly different uh, dynamic as far as it goes but i am going to have to be looking into this one a little bit more uh, at least on some of those uh higher level aspects to see if there's uh more details about its corporate structure that i missed that could explain uh some of the uncertainties surrounding it but either way that's going to do it for us today i'm not sure which company we're going to be looking at next uh, but i do know that uh, companies that i personally own already are gonna are starting to put out their 10ks uh we covered qualcomm earlier this week uh saying how we, we had already done valuations on them but we were basically just updating them because new 10ks had come out but well new company other companies are starting to put out 10ks uh in the, the last the latter part of this year as well so we'll probably be doing some of those a couple of them are in, in positions i already own as well as other positions that i'm uh very fond of uh, so like for example you're here around this day tyson should be reporting that's one i'll be doing uh skyworks sh should be reporting that's one i'll probably be doing uh disney will be reporting sometime soonish we'll be doing that one whenever it comes out um we already did um we already did dr horton their their 10k actually was only going to come out very soon after i did the valuation it's a bit of a shame but i probably won't be doing that one so soon considering i just did it but either way that's what uh, these little red markers tell me is when the 10Ks are going to be coming out. Uh, so 
not sure which one we're doing on Monday, but perhaps one of those few that I just mentioned, uh, Tyson, Skyworks, uh, one of those, but either way, we stream three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, Fridays, around the time that market closes, so I will catch